The H2O Podcast. This is a free download from BBC Radio Solent. The podcast terms and conditions are on the BBC Radio Solent website, along with details of our other podcasts. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. Good afternoon, this is H2O on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnston, and this is the second of two programmes recorded at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. Today, I'm at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Also this week, we'll hear from Bob Fisher and his thoughts about the America's Cup. Neil reports from a Gallipoli veteran here in Portsmouth. And we look back on the day that the three Cunardas met in Southampton, again. But first, let's find out about the museum here in Portsmouth. With me is Sally Moore. Now, Sally, what's your job? I'm a customer care assistant on behalf of the National Museum of the Royal Navy and HMS Victory. So your job is really to look at people who want to come in and look at the museum and show them round or guide them. Indeed, we get a lot of visitors, international visitors, local visitors, people with questions about both their history and also the medieval history at large. So, there's quite a lot here though, isn't there? I mean, how's this museum divided up? What sort of sections have you got? Well, currently we're standing in the main area, and linking off from here we have the Nelson Gallery, which is specifically about the life of Vice Admiral Lord Nelson. And then on the opposite side, we have the 18th century sailing navy. So this area really links in, if you go to HMS Victory, this gives you further information about what the men would live like, and also what you'd expect to have Lord Nelson's life as well. And other parts of the museum? Well, as you go through the 18th century sailing navy, that links onto our modern gallery known as HMS. We wanted to really build specialist place to talk about the personal stories of men and women who served during the last hundred years of naval warfare. Hence the name HMS also stands for Hear My Story. I like that. <laughs> and after that, any other sections we can go and look at? At the very far end of HMS, we actually have a changeable gallery space. Now, this is the only space currently in Portsmouth Dockyard that is able to cater for this. What we do is we intend to change the gallery normally every four to six months, different attractions, normally linking in to whatever is happening in the wider sphere of history. Now, at the moment, we have the Gallipoli campaign. We're doing a special exhibit about that, and that's going to be running up until the opening of Monitor 33, which will be on the 6th of August. Well, perhaps, Sally, you let me go and see the Gallipoli gallery, which everyone talking about at the moment, but more from here shortly. First, it's the America's Cup. It's never far from the news, and sadly, neither is controversy. World expert Bob Fisher has written an open letter to the organisers expressing his concern some of the decisions that have been shaping the next competition. Richard Latter has been chatting with him. Well, I've been involved with the America's Cup since I was a kid. Um, the men in Brightling Sea, where I was born, used to... Uh, sit in the fisherman's shelter, you know, tail end of the, the war, and here am I, a young boy, and they're wearing jerseys with shamrock and endeavour emblazoned across their chest. They'd been there, they'd been part of the crews of those boats that had taken part in the pre-war years. So I first learned about the America's Cup from them. And, of course, you know, when they told me how they'd been diddled out of it and all the shenanigans... I just wanted to know more. And so I started researching and then the cup became another feature again. We, we, it was started again all over in 1958. Um, and I knew some of the guys who were sailing on the boats in those, in, on Scepter in those days. And I made it a, you know, my, my job to find out more and more about it. And as they go, go on, I got terribly involved and... In 1967, I sailed a catamaran called Lady Helmsman and we won the Little America's Cup. Uh, and our sponsor decided that uh, he ought to give me a present. He asked me what I'd like and I said I'd like to go to Newport to see the, the other America's Cup. So he paid my fare and my hotel and sent me to, sent me to America. And I saw the, some races of the 1967 America's Cup, and I haven't missed one since. So I went again in 70, and then I went again in 74, 77, 80, and 83 when it changed hands. And then it was off to Fremantle for 87, and San Diego for 90, 92, 90, 95, and then... It was uh, off to New Zealand 
and I did the 2000 in New Zealand and the 2003 in New Zealand. And uh, so that's when I was really into it up to my nuts and really I couldn't think more about it than it was about time I started writing a history of the thing. And I was, during the Jubilee regatta here in 2001, I was walking across the marina with Bill Coke, who had won the cup in 1992 uh, and who had uh, put a team in of, of women, all women team in, in 1995. Uh, and he was still thoroughly, you know, cup smitten. And he knew that I was thinking of writing his history, you see, and he said, <laughs> and we're walking across there, and he said, Bob, how's the book coming on? I said, well, Bill, it isn't. Oh, he said, why? I said, well, Bill, I've got to earn a living. I've got a wife and, you know, to keep and all this sort of thing. And, I, you know, it's, it's hard. He said, I think you'd better come and see me when you're next in America. When's that likely to be? So I said, Key West Race Week in uh, January? Yeah, he said, uh, what I'll do is we'll, we'll finalise this and if you come, if I'll send a plane down to Key West, pick you up and bring you up to West Palm Beach and get you back to Miami so we can have a day talking about this before you go home. So I said, oh, yeah, that's right. That's a nice bill. Thank you very much. And so I went over there and Bill came up with the idea that he ought to fund me <laughs> to write this book. And he did. And you very proudly are holding a copy, a copy of the book in your hands. <laughs> They're very, very large books. They're volume one and two. Um, beautifully bound you must be so proud to have finally completed oh them. yeah i am very proud to have done that but you know this one only goes to 2003 but where's the volume three then well volume three is held up at the moment because i've got to get some clearance on some copyright in order to get it on, on with a with a publisher and then i've already started volume four wow well you <laughs> which i hope is going to be called the cup comes home uh, well, fingers crossed. Well, you certainly are an authority on the America's Cup. Um, and you've now written an open letter to the organisers <laughs> of the Cup with some concerns in. What are those main concerns? That they're not doing anything that's right. They, they, the organisers, which is uh, the America's Cup Events Authority, which organises it, um, which is run by the Defender, the defending club, effectively, essentially. But in this case, the club was bought out of bankruptcy by Larry Ellison, who could buy anything out of bankruptcy. So he really dictates what goes on. But his dictate is to a former sailor, Russell Coots, who's a New Zealander, who won, has won the cup on several occasions, and who, um, who he won it first of all for New Zealand. He defended it for New Zealand. And then he joined the Swiss team and won it for them. Then he had an argument with the, the team's owner and uh, was bound by uh, the cup rules that he couldn't go to another team for that one, which was 2007. But immediately that was over, he joined Oracle and um, came up with the ideas that allowed Oracle Racing, which is the Larry Ellison team, for Golden Gate Yacht Club to do what they wanted, which was to take them on on a one for one basis in the biggest boats there's ever been seen in the America's Cup. Two multi hulls, one 90 feet long and um, nearly as broad, and a trimaran that was even bigger with a wing sail that was. <laughs> whose wing was bigger than the, the wingspan of a seven, the whole wingspan of a 707. Um, it was just ginormous, over 100 feet in the sky. So, yeah, um, it was huge. And, yeah, they raced, and it was pretty obvious who was going to win. And, um, yeah, there was all sorts of shenanigans in that one. So that, that's, you know, that, that fills up quite a lot of uh, <laughs> volume three. And uh, then... You know, after that, he Russell went on to become very much the the leader of the pack, and um, so he was the manager 
the CEO of ACEA. Well, if you're the chief executive officer, you should get things in fairly good order. And I remember on the first time he had the, the meeting uh, to tell us all what was going on within a month of the last one happening. So he knew which way it was going. This time it is now 16 months and it's only just getting around to finalising. It wasn't very long ago. We didn't even know where it was going to be held. And now it's in Bermuda of all places. That's not even America. I mean, they're messing about with it. They're treating it like as though it's any old regatta, like it's a beach cat regatta anywhere in the world. And it isn't. It is the America's Cup. It's the sort of holy of holies for yachtsmen. It is not as a, a former sponsor put it, a beach cat regatta with, with French fries and beer. It's a champagne event. And what's behind this reduction in boat size? Well, that came at a late hour. We were told that it was going to be in smaller boats. It was going to be in 62-foot foiling catamarans. And we're all set for that. And then, uh, a month ago, they decided that it should be in 48-foot catamarans with foils. Why? It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be very little cheaper to do that, but it really has upset one of the major parties. Um, Patricio Bertelli, the head of Prada, who has his team Luna Rossa, has been in the cup on four previous occasions um, and was due to go again and had a team of 90 working down in Cagliari in Sardinia. I mean, it was really, there were 40 in the design department, 40 in the sailing department, boat builders and all sorts of things. And if they had 12,000 square metres of space, I mean, that's huge. And you, you go into this, I, I'd been down there and saw it. And, you know, it was going flat out, full chat. And he pulled the plug. Some teams, though, including Ben Ainsley's Racing, have been supportive of the decision, haven't they? Well, I'm sorry. You know, this is one when I disagree with Ben. I think Ben's going to win the Cup, however. But, you know, this is not what it's about. And to go that small has nothing. I mean, the America's Cup was something you looked up to. Up that way. Um, that way. You know, you can't say these are the little boats that go only slightly bigger than the little boats they're going around in for their America's Cup World Series. An unnecessary expense, I have to say that. You should hold the America's Cup should be a, <laughs> the defenders having their, their series to produce the best boat for the defence and the challengers having a series to produce the best challenger. It shouldn't need all this going around, stirring up interest. The interest was there anyway. What about the effect of the withdrawal of the Luna Rossa? What effect will that have on the Cup? Well, it'll, it'll take one team completely out. Um, I'm waiting to go and see uh, uh, Patricio Bertelli and find out how he really feels about this. And he'll tell me. I know he'll tell me. I've had interviews with him before. And we get quite close and uptight on these things, so, it's, uh, you know, he'll tell me. But I, I want to go and see. I know why he's done it. It's a matter, he's a principled man, and he doesn't like being mucked about in the last minute. And this is last minute muck about. Is it a surprise to see Dean Barker in a late Japanese bed? No. I think it's, well, it's a surprise to me that they bothered to hire him. I would have fired him years ago, but, you know, he, he just wouldn't take another post with T Team New Zealand. They wanted him to be their uh, on-the-water expert, not as a sailor, because I think he's past that. I really do think he's past that. The young man, this is a young man's sport now, it's on these foiling catamarans, very much a young man's game. And he's just too up for it. Bob Fisher chatting there with BBC Radio Sailor's Richard Latto. And you can be sure there won't be the last time this historic cup will be in the news for controversy. H2O on BBC Radio Solent.
I'm Robin Knox Johnson. This week I'm at the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth's Historic Dockyard with Sally Moore. Sally, we're on our way to the Gallipoli exhibit, but we've stopped here in, alongside a four-inch gun, which started the First World War, as far as the Navy was concerned. <laughs> this is known as the Lance gun. It was the first gun that fired the first shot at sea during the First World War. We have it right at the entrance, so it's the first thing that visitors see when they're entering the HMS galleries, because its importance in history is undeniable. And uh, it fired its shots on the 5th of August, and the result was the sinking of the first German warship of the war. That is correct. So the, uh, she caught a German mine, uh, Koenig and Ries, uh, setting mines off the Dutch coast and sank her with this gun. She did, and obviously from there, history happened, the First World War. Quite often people assume that the First World War was a land battle. Um, trench warfare is very much entrenched in people's minds when they think of this time period. The Navy sacrifice at this time period and the men who fought and died on the boats and the ships that were necessary for the protection of our country at this time period is undeniable. So that's one of the things that we really want to highlight is not only did men die on land, but they died at sea to protect this country and their stories are just as important. And in a couple of weeks we're going to hear about the forgotten wrecks of World War I. Of course, the Navy lost 43,000 men in the First World War. It's a very high proportion of the men serving. Indeed it was. One of the things we wanted to do for the centenary, uh, we actually had a community project in which poppies were knitted by the community at large, including the ship badges for ships that were sunk and men who died, and we had it hanging around the last gun in memorial to those who did lose their lives. Yeah, must be very, very emotive. Well, let's go on to the Gallipoli Gallery. I'm with Sally Moore at the National Museum of the Navy. And Sally, we're in the Gallipoli uh, section, this new section you put on to celebrate, or rather commemorate, the attacks on Gallipoli. Um, seems to be quite a lot here, actually, doesn't there? There's, I'm, I'm just watching a, a movie here showing a warship sinking, which I don't like the look of. Uh, and there's some men in the trenches. But it was a major, major amphibious operation. Indeed it was. They believed that they could push through the Navy and end the war much quickly. They wanted to move away from the entrenched warfare of the land battles, but ultimately they ended up falling into the same traps again themselves. The gallery itself is called Gallipoli Myth and Memory. One of the things that we wanted to do was to pull out all the individual strands as to why this large-scale campaign ultimately ended in such utter failure. Yes, it, it was a tragic um, action. Although... Strategically, it, it, it made a certain amount of sense if we could have pulled it off, but I think we sort of told them we were going to do it long before we did it. <laughs> That's one of the things we talk about. There's so many different factors to take into account in the operation of this scale. It wasn't any one thing that resulted in the end failings of the campaign. There were so many other things. You know, you had the experience of the Turkish officers, you had the decisions to land, you had illness, you had ill-prepared um, lack of supplies. All these things all came together, and there was a lot of anger at the time. So that's one of the things, like I said, going back to it, pulling out what is not true, what was rumour, what was conjuncture, and what actually happened, and objectively laying all of these things out so people can come in, learn about what actually happened at Gallipoli, and go away making their own ideas and their own understanding of how this campaign played out. Sally, what's your favourite bit of this exhibition? There is a piece of footage that we have. Um, it's actually the only surviving footage from the, uh, the battle. It was shot and edited by uh, Rupert Murdoch's father and so it was a British journalist and two Australian editors it's the only surviving it's about 10 minutes it's on a constant loop in the gallery and one of the things the reasons that I like it so much is that the First World War is really the first time a major conflict has been documented in such a way not just in written um, analysis and written accounts of their experiences but also in film in sound in all of these things that you can actually have a real idea of what people went through and that video really encapsulates just the ordinary struggle of the men who've worked and died in this battle. And people can see that here? Mm -hmm. They can see it here. Well, it seems to be well worth coming to look at and fascinating. Um, very interesting operation. Ended in failure, but not through lack of bravery and determination by the people involved. That's exactly right. And 
although so many died on both sides, you know, the Turkish had tremendous losses as well. And we end on the note with the graveyards and the Turkish sign saying, even though we were enemies, your sons are safe on our soil now. Their fight is over. So regardless of what happened, ultimately great bravery on both sides. Now, HMS M33 saw action service in Gallipoli and has been in dry dock just starboard of HMS Victory for some 18 years. Now she's under restoration and that work has been part funded in a unique way. And our reporter Neil Sackley has been to see how the work is progressing. His guide is the project director from the National Museum of the Royal Navy, Matthew Sheldon. Just three warships which survived from the Royal Navy's First World War. Um, I know I'm biased but I think she's the most interesting. She saw the most action. She was out in action for over three and a half years. Um, shell splashes all around her off Turkey during the Gallipoli campaign and she's got a fantastic story to tell. Very important lady. She is, yeah, and I think actually, uh, you know, you only start to appreciate when centenaries like this come around. You're going to hear the work underway as we stand here. It's been great the way it has captured people's imagination. When you get on board her, she's got an atmosphere all of her own. Can we go and have a look? Yeah, let's get on board and you can um, put up with a racket that everyone else is listening to. All right, yeah. let's go. Well, down into the dry dock and inside the tent, and, and here she is, and doesn't she look wonderful? Well, she does. This is about as bare as she's going to look, because we're busy really stabilising her hull, which is 100 years old, steel and riveted uh, deck plates and so on. So we're getting back to a stable surface to begin the elements of restoration that we want to do. How long has she been here? She's actually been sat in this dry dock since 1997. Um, so she's in a historic 18th century dock in the shadow of victory. And it's taken us really that long, and it's a partnership with Hampshire County Council, to release the money, generate the momentum to get ourselves open. Projects like this don't come cheap, do they? They don't. This is a, a £2.4 million project. I think that's quite good value, actually, for getting open, the only First World War ship that will be open next year. And we've had a really good partnership with other people and key, I guess, is people like the Heritage Lottery Fund who've put nearly £1.8 million into it. And that shows how significant they think it is. And the National Museum are dipping the toes into a little bit of crowdfunding for this. We are, absolutely. We want to um, give other people a chance to get involved and make their small contributions. We're after £19,150, which if you look at it carefully says 1915 and we've got a website where people can get involved and give. Go on that and see some of the kind of detail about the ship and her history and some of the stories that are associated with her. So once the restoration's done, come August, what will we be able to see? What we're going to do is take people into the bottom of a dry dock and bring people up into the ship by almost coming underneath her. And that's important because she has this very shallow bottom that let her get close to the coast. So they'll understand, actually, the ship as a whole but then we'll start to get into all those incredible spaces in the ship, the forward mess deck, the officers' cabins, the wheel room, the chart house, which are very basic. The crew lived in this ship for over three and a half years in the First World War without going home. So they'll get that sense, but they'll also get a sense that she's the only survivor from this Gallipoli campaign. And so we're going to have some quite amazing AV presentations in her interior that bring that battle alive to people. So it will be, I think, a unique visit even on the fantastic historic ships we have here in Portsmouth already. It'll be something different and it will, she'll be presented, I think, warts and all. Matthew Sheldon talking to our reporter Neil Sackley on board HMS M33. And shortly you can hear what happened when he took Neil on a tour of her firepower on deck and onto the bridge. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robbie Knox Johnston. This week I'm at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Now Sally Moore, who's showing me that round. Sally, where are we now? Robin, we're currently in the core of our HMS galleries. So and what have you got here? Well, we're currently standing next to a Bofors gun, but this is the central linking area. So the area we've just come through contains all our artefacts regarding the last hundred years of naval warfare. The area we're about to go through goes to the reflection area where people are encouraged to share their personal stories and experiences of their time within the Navy. And also that leads on to our Gallipoli exhibit. So you've got it all here, haven't you? And here's a, what we used to know as the 4060, mm -hmm. a Bofors gun. Uh, an oldish one because it hasn't got the hydraulic controls on it, which I'm more used to. Indeed, no. This one's still using handles. Two men to turn it and then three men to load it from the side. Yes, it was heavy on manpower, wasn't it? Basically an anti-aircraft gun, of course. 
and we just festooned our warships with them. Mm-hmm. But I t- see you've removed the seats, so you can't actually sit there and operate it. You can't currently, but we do encourage people to come down, especially children. We like to get them hands-on with our exhibits in order to get an understanding of how the equipment would have worked at this time period. And as you all know, small boys love playing with guns, so of course this is something they really enjoy looking at. You may not have noticed, though, if you turn around to the other side, to the ceiling, we also have an aerial display of all the different kinds of missiles from the time period and also nautical warfare as well from all the different time periods. So we try and really link in the changing technologies men would have used in a very short period of time. Yes, it really is. You covered it rather well, haven't you? From the Bofa to the missiles, it's, mm-hmm. it is really very impressive. The Bofa was cheaper to operate, however. <laughs> H2O on BBC Radio Solent. More from here shortly. But first, let's look back at an event that happened on Southampton Water last weekend. In what has become a regular occurrence, all three Cunard Queens were together. And it was for a special reason. Neil Sackley looks back on the day. The three ships arrived from their respective world cruises to a dull and grey spring morning. The meeting of the vessels marked the start of Cunard's 175th anniversary celebrations. It was also a rare opportunity for the three captains to gather together. Commodore Christopher and Queen Victoria. Captain Inga Torhauge, Queen Elizabeth. And Captain Chris Wells on the Queen Mary. Captains, first of all, welcome to Southampton. And this is a very rare honour to to have all three of you together. And I guess it's something that you guys never get to experience either. We don't get together that often. Uh, This is only the fourth occasion in uh, all the years that we've had the the three Cunard Queens that they've all been together here in Southampton. And even if we get all three ships together in the same port, we don't always get all the captains together. And thankfully, the sun's just come out right on cue, Christopher. Absolutely. That forecast paid off. Well, Southampton is Cunard's home, spiritual home, and, and, and it's a very, very special year for Cunard this year. Yes, Southampton is our home port. Here we are at the end of our world voyage and this 175th anniversary of Cunard crossing the Atlantic. This is our home port. This is where we are based. This is where we've been based for uh, more than 60 years. And this is where the ships uh, come in and out of. For the Queen Mary II particularly, it is the start of our voyages as we cross to to New York on our transatlantic service. So this is our home port. And so it's a a great honour to bring the ships back to their home port and to have them all in on the same day is just uh, a real privilege. Well, for the passengers finishing their world cruises, that's the end of their cruise. But, of course, for the ships and and for you, uh, it never stops. This is just a day stopover. Yeah, really. I mean, on the Queen Elizabeth, we have quite a lot of guests, which we have to return back to Hamburg, which are finishing their world voyage in Hamburg. So we're getting them off, and then we're starting another voyage from there to Amsterdam, back to Southampton. Business continues in port as well as at sea, just a different type of business. But this voyage, we set off on a Lusitania Remembered voyage and we will be in Cove in Ireland on exactly 100 years after the sinking of that great Cunard liner in World War I. And I can't have the three of you all together without asking you each individually which is your favourite ship on the line. I always say I have three children, there are three Cunard liners, there are no favourites. I always say the one I'm on. I'll have to agree with Inga. It's always diplomatic to say the one you're on. (laughs) Very diplomatic. What the chairman of Cunard, David Dingle, told me that Southampton is still an incredibly important home for the company. Today in particular, we're celebrating um, Southampton as being the home of Cunard. Um, We operated our first ship regularly from Southampton as long ago as 1911. Uh, We moved our company headquarters here in uh, 1966 and uh, nowadays all three of our ships, uh, Queen Mary II, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria, are home ported here in Southampton. So Southampton is very much our home and we're delighted to be here. Yet the 175th, the the main celebrations of course in Liverpool this year. Well, yes, of course, uh, we always have to be a little bit careful um, here. Um, But um, factually, we must remember um, that Cunard um, did actually originate in Liverpool, uh, and that's where the original offices were and where the ships um, first um, sailed from. And indeed, the first Cunard transatlantic crossing in 1840 went from there to Halifax and then Boston. So we 
we do feel that it's important from a heritage perspective to to mark that. Um, but let nobody take away uh, the importance of Southampton and Southampton being our home of today. Always a very special occasion when the three Cunardas come together. The fourth time it's happened, um, it, it, it's becoming a kind of semi-regular thing, but no less impressive. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Um, certainly when you see those three fabulous ocean liners all together, it is a very special moment, no matter how often it occurs. But, you know, we still like to retain a bit of scarcity value just to make sure that it remains the special event that it always is. And Queen Mary, too, of course, very special in the fact that she's the only cruise liner. Uh, yes, absolutely. She was built um, specifically as a passenger ocean-going liner, through and through um, and she has a unique design um, she is uniquely capable of um, traveling at speed through uh, any ocean anywhere in the world and uh, she is a, a, a very very special ship indeed david dingle cunard's chairman well on sunday the queens were just three of the ships that were in not an unusually busy day for the port Southampton's harbour master is Captain Martin Phipps. Um, we do occasionally have six cruise ships, and two years ago we had seven cruise ships in, so we're able to do it. Um, from the marine side, it's it's not too much of a problem normally. It's just a case of um, sorting the traffic out, and then we give them slots and fit them in. More of a problem from the land side with the sheer sheer number of people coming into the port and into Southampton. The cruise ships schedules are planned possibly up to years ahead. Yeah. How, how far ahead do you know what their plans are and, and, and how far ahead can you work? Um, a, a fair distance ahead. I mean, we've already got most of the bookings for 2016 already, um, which cruise companies need to do because they need to print their brochures, advertise cruises, that sort of thing. And also we made to make sure we don't have too many in on one day, so we've got the terminals um, available for them so the planning for that is done usually a good year ahead probably so 2016 we've got most of the bookings already there will there will be some changes but for this particular event it's uh, you know it's um, Q&R's 175th birthday this year um, so we started um, planning this with Q&R probably a couple of months ago looking at what they wanted and uh, this this for us was relatively easy operation to do um, the, the seven we had with P&O a couple of years ago was obviously took a lot more planning mm. and this one uh, that involved um, royalty as well so um, pretty sort of um, standard marine operation for us On these set piece events how much of it is what the company wants and how much of it is what you tell them they can have? Um, we, we try to always please the customer so we will try to do what they want to do. There may be occasions we have to change their plans very slightly because obviously we have other customers in the port as well and it's trying to make sure that it that it all works but um, not normally we can accommodate most people's wishes. Of course it always hinges on um, getting the passengers on board and you only need an accident on a motorway somewhere and a couple of coaches go you know get stuck in a jam, passengers don't arrive and the ship can be delayed. Uh, Sunday it all worked fine you know the um, the anthem of seas and the um, Balmoral able to get away on time which left left the three queens to um, sail and do their uh, convoy out so the plan worked well it was a convoy along Southampton water because actually it, it, it's not that wide along here is it no it's not uh, but then when they got into the Solent, it's a little bit of a routine I mean, how much of that was planned by ABP and how much of that was a request from Cunard um, it was a request from Cunard if that, if that could be, if that was possible, which it was, and it then was a case really of just notifying other traffic and uh, making sure that the, the pilots on board the ships were all familiar with the plan that was going to take place. And uh, you know, I think it um, for photographs and things turned out very well. And of course, all that planning has to come together and work on the water on the day. Duncan Christie was on board Pathfinder, one of the Harbour Master's launches. We're not showing the the path for the ship we're just keeping the channel clear and keeping the the leisure boats out of the uh the way of the ships so um you know we're here to interact if we have to um and make sure that everybody has a good day because one of your colleagues is pilot on board and so his job is to plot the course of the ship whereas yours is to clear the way yes yeah the our pilot is on board for the safe navigation of the ship from when it leaves the port of Southampton alongside the dock um, until the NAB channel 
nav deep water channel when the pilot is disembarked onto one of our designated pilot boats and then the ship will carry on on its way. That's Neil Sackley reporting from on board the Harbour Master's launch watching the three great big Cunard liners. Now back to that rare survivor from the First World War which is undergoing restoration work here at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. HMS M33 has been lovingly restored. Matthew Sheldon took Neil Sattley on a tour of her firepower on deck and onto the bridge. So we've come up to the bow of the ship now and this is really what she was all about, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. We're looking at her six inch gun. So for such a small ship, actually being able to fire a six inch shell, something like 14,000 yards, was really gave her a big punch for the kind of size that she had. We're very lucky to have these two First World War guns on her and we're looking at one that's in the process of being worked on. But when people come on board, actually, these will be in full working order. We're not actually going to fire any shells at HMS Victory or the modern ships, but you can train the gun, you can open the breaches, you can load them, and you can get a sense of actually how central these were to the whole purpose of the ship. So we're really excited to be putting these back in working order. What sort of firepower would she have carried? Yeah, she had these two six-inch guns, so one forward, one aft, and she was all about getting close to shore and firing at targets on land. So she was not about sinking ships at sea, because she was so slow, you wouldn't want to put her in action. She was about hitting guns on shore or troops on shore. And she had a big range, as I say, you know, many miles. I know she was often firing at targets she couldn't see. She was hiring, firing over hillsides, over ridges, and relying on aircraft or on spotters on shore to tell her, actually, were you hitting the targets? You need to adjust your aim, you need to extend your fire. So it was very joined up, at least in principle, that was the idea. Obviously Gallipoli is what she's most famous for. After that campaign, did she see active service again? She did. I mean, she stays out in the Mediterranean after January 16 when the campaign ends and she fights in a, a number of campaigns we, don't, we just forget really, like the Bulgarian campaign. But she's under fire in that from zeppelins and aircrafts and a whole range of things. And then probably most excitingly, in 1919, she goes out to Russia in the Russian Civil War and she's fighting the Bolsheviks out 200 miles up the rivers in North Russia. That's when she gets hit four times and we've still got in her holes from those Russian shells that penetrated her hull. She never lost anyone in action, actually. She just was, really was known as a lucky ship. Despite being hit, nobody died on board her. So we, I think we hope she's going to be lucky for us too. And she was one of how many? Uh, she was of vessels of her exact type. There were five built, all at the same time. But monitors as a whole, there were nearly 40 built or commissioned in those early months of the war. Um, so she's definitely a real example of a First World War kind of ship. She's a reaction to what was needed at the time. OK, well, let's go to the bridge. Yeah, absolutely. Come on up, watch your step, and um, you can see where they steered from. So we're just looking at what is a very basic steel box up on the bridge, which is the wheelhouse. It's got this funny raised platform in it, which is raised up with a steering position, so that actually the person on the ship's wheel could look over the ship's gun, this big ship's gun that is blocking the view. But within there, you would have somebody steering, you'd have the navigating officer with his charts working, you'd have the captain with his kind of little day bed that he would sleep on and, and, and spend most of his time on the bridge. And then just behind, you've got the wireless telegraphy office because that was where messages were received and sent and need to communicate to bridge. But you've also got voice pipes that take you to communicate with other parts of the ship. You've got a an engine room telegraph that allowed him to communicate with the engine room sort of down below. So it's a pretty basic bridge. It's nothing like the bridges that you see on ships these days, but it is still that kind of heart of the ship. And actually, it's a very similar sort of profile to the famous one that we know of, Titanic. It is, yeah. I mean, it's all about that visibility, and we're looking at the holes where her windows were, but those would usually be hatched up. So it would sort of be an open bridge with weather blowing in but ability to close them when they weren't at sea. And you're still really relying at this date on the eye for navigation and on for visibility. And that's what you need from, from a position like this. What we're missing, of course, is the mast that is now currently off being conserved. That has a crow's nest in it, which you could use for observation, but also particularly to help spot for your guns, to see where your gunfire was falling. 
And how was she powered? She was oil powered, so relatively state of the art in that sense. Um, she carried, I think, 40 tonnes of oil fuel, which the crew loved because they were coaling through a hose pipe, they said. They weren't any longer uh, doing that kind of whole filthy coaling operation. Powered by oil, relatively slow. She had a top speed of 9.6 knots. Um, so they didn't spend a lot on creating some dashing destroyer that could cut through the seas. That was just about her getting around, getting into position. We know she was not a comfortable boat to be at sea on because she's so flat and so slow she would tend to move around a lot and quite often ended up being towed. When she went to Gallipoli, she was towed all the way from, um, all the way through the Mediterranean just to get her there on time. Matthew Sheldon from the National Museum of the Royal Navy with our reporter Neil Sapley on board HMS M33 here in Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. And there's a link to her website on our page for today. That's at bbc.co.uk slash Solent. Well, I'm Robbie Knox Johnson. This is the H2O show from BBC Radio Solent. And I'm with Sally Moore in the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Sally, where are we now? We're currently looking upon our artefact. Well, now HMS, like most traditional galleries, we have things set up in the cabinets that's fit in with specific things. So we have cabinets about the battles that were engaged in. So, for example, the Battle of Jutland, the Atlantic convoys, all the things that you would traditionally expect to find in the museum. But because the last hundred years were so varied in the kinds of conflicts and challenges the Navy's faced, and also changes as well, we have the artefact was a collection of things that really fall under no one type. So, for example, right in the centre, we have one of the training canoes from the Cockershell Heroes. Yes, you can see that. Uh, that was an amazing achievement. And I see you've got one of the signs from the Duke of York, the battleship that sank the Scharnhorst. Indeed we do. As you can see, it's clearly enormous. <laughs> well, she was a 35,000 ton battleship, but uh, she sank the um, Scharnhorst, the German battle cruiser, in a snowstorm mm. off the North Cape. Um, and she didn't really see her. She did it all by radar, controlled gunnery. Quite amazing, really. Mm. And that's a Carly float, isn't it? That is indeed a Carly float. Uh, also, if you look just above the uh, Duke of York, you'll see a set of antlers. Whale Island used to have a naval zoo on it. Now, when I served at Whale Island, I do not remember a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Carly float, of course, ships carried them in profusion because if the ship sinking, there was something that floated. And so you see a lot of them around. But uh, nice to see one. I can't imagine too many men getting on that one, though, can you? One of the main issues with the Cardi floats was the danger of exposure. So as many men as possible would be using it as a flotation device, but there was no cover or shelter. However, the longest survivor was 133 days. 130... what days? 133. It was a Chinese sailor. He was picked up 133 days after his ship was sunk. What on earth did he feed on? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Quite amazing, isn't it? Now, you've also got a motorcycle here. What's that got to do with it? This was stopped at a checkpoint. Um, it's basically linked in with the Iraq War. Because of the change in the kind of battle tactics they can expect, uh, terrorist attacks are much more common nowadays than ever before. That particular bike was challenged at a checkpoint. The Royal Marine commander challenged the person. He saw him wheeling the motorbike towards their blockade, their checkpoint and noticed something was wrong. When they stopped and challenged the man, they had to tackle him to the ground because he had the detonator in his hand and when they dissected the bike, it was full of explosives. Had it gone off, it would have killed everybody at the checkpoint. Because it just shows how alert Royal Marines have to be on those sort of duties these days. And you've also got an ejection seat I can see. Indeed we do. Um, all of these things on the artefact wall, they link in, not with any one thing, but with the general idea of the changes, like I said, the changes, the challenges. All these things have unique stories, but don't fit into any one item of our collection, but their stories are important also to be heard. And it shows the width and depth, really, of what the Royal Navy has to do. Sally, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for sparing the time. I'm sure there are lots of people who want to come round and see this, and I'm certainly coming back again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. It's been lovely to meet you. This is H2O. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. And I'm in Portsmouth this week, and with me is Neil Sackley. Robin, that museum was just fascinating. Wasn't it? You know, I, I haven't been in it for about a couple of years, and it's certainly improved since I last went there. And what a fascinating guide we had in Sally. Wasn't she good? Oh, just amazing. Just am and, and, and seeing the, the Gallipoli 
exhibit sort of really brings it to life. It does too, doesn't it? And looking at the fact we are still using pre-dreadnought battleships to shell because they still had their guns on them, but you know they were they couldn't go involved in the fleet action. They were overtaken by design, but nevertheless they were useful there. And of course we lost one. Yes. So it was an expensive operation for everyone, including the navy. And it's going to be fascinating to see M33 back open to the public again uh, from August, which is uh, timed to coincide with the 100th anniversary of her uh, being part of that campaign. Well, one of the Navy's jobs, you know, it's support for the people ashore, the monitors for that, and of course she's a miniature monitor, mm. and the Navy still does it to this day, it gives um, support to the people ashore from the warships, the gun line as they call it. Um, I just want to talk to you about um, Grey Power. Because this time last year, you just made the announcement that you were about to do Route to Rum. Uh, your success in that has gone down in history. But we haven't heard what's happened to Grey Power since. Where is she? Well, um, having got to Guadeloupe um, and picked up this enormous bottle of rum, which I'm still <laughs> wondering what to do with, I don't say the obvious, drink it, because there's too much to drink. Um, I sailed it down with a couple of friends to Grenada, found a wonderful little yard there, and we hauled her out. With a bit of difficulty, it was a bit shallow in the dock, but um, I've taught them how to use an airlift, so they're going to deepen it before we relaunch. So I'm flying out to pick her up again, and we'll sail her up with two crew to Newport, Rhode Island, and then we're going to get ready for the Atlantic race, which starts for us on the 1st of July, and is a race from Newport, Rhode Island, across the Atlantic. Finish line is actually the Lizard, but then we come straight on to Cows, so... I'm doing a quiet Atlantic crossing this year, but this time I have got four other people joining me. And it's a highly experienced crew. I've got two solar circle navigators in Bernard Gallet from France, Dilip Donde, commander of the Indian Navy, who's first Indian to go around the world, David Asher, who was Commodore of Rourke, and a friend of mine from Monaco, Josh Warren. So it's a good crew. All of them are close personal friends, so I think this is going to be a fun voyage. And as we found out t today elsewhere, you're actually going to be racing against Stuart Quarry. Yes, it sounds like I will be. And I don't underestimate Stuart. He may be quietly spoken, but he's very experienced. So we're going to lose you for a few months uh, from the programme, but hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you en route. Well, we should be able to. If, if all the electronics are working, you know my views upon, about electronics in a boat, but if they're working, it should be quite easy to patch through to you and uh, keep you up to date with how we're getting on and what the level is in that blinking great bottle of rum. Well, there's a few things you're going to be missing then uh, through the summer in the Solents. Uh, in, in no particular order, um, old gaffers. Oh, I'm going to miss the old gaffers. And I'm also going to miss the great big regatta there they've got in June for the Royal Yacht Squadron's bicentenary, which I'm very sad to miss. But I can't do both. I'm a squadron entry for the race across the Atlantic, so you know I've got to get the boat there and do that. Uh, but I hopefully will get back in time to see the uh, America's Cup racing which is in July 23rd, 26th. And then, of course, we've got a regatta week for the squadron as well, which we'll be around for. So I'm hoping to get back and probably get into it. And then, of course, immediately after that, we've got Cows Week. But actually, I'm probably going to be a bit head down getting ready for the start of the next Clipper race on the, at the end of August. So it's quite a busy summer. Uh, quite a lot of race organising. Almost too much race organising. I prefer to be sailing, but actually I'm getting quite a nice bit of sailing, so I'm not complaining. So this race across the Atlantic then, it's almost going to be um, a little bit of a rest for you before the storm. It's that, that is the calm before the storm for you. It is, but you know, when you look at my crew and you look at their experience, you will realise that actually we're all very competitive. And so I've got a team with me. I don't think we're going to be very slack when we're racing back. <laughs> we're there to race. And even when we're feeling relaxed at the 10-minute gun, by the time the start gun goes, I suspect we'll be in race aggressive uh, race mode. You uh, touched on the Royal Yacht Squadron. Of course, it's their 200th anniversary this year. And in fact, um, we have recorded a programme already for broadcast while you're away celebrating the, the squadron's anniversary. And what, what a fascinating place. Isn't it fascinating? And its history, of course, is too. And it's been a stalwart, really, of yachting in this country and, in fact, throughout the world because it's, it's universally recognised. Um, but what a fascinating story of how yachting has changed from the early days when it very much a rich man's sport to today when how many sailing clubs around Portsmouth Harbour? Is it 12? These are, these, this is where the strength of British sailing is in those little clubs with their dinghies go out there and just race every weekend, want to lay a slipway where well, they roll their sleeves up and lay the concrete. Probably their clubhouse is a garden shed. 
but that's where the strength of our sport really lies. Well, H2O will be in good hands. Um, Shelley, Tracy, and of course Jeff, who's uh, with us next week. Uh, so you don't need to worry too much. Actually, with that team, I'm not in the, I'm not the slightest worried about it. It's in very, very good hands, in my view, and I'm sure they'll be just as uh, keen as we've always been on finding the interesting stories and bringing them to our listeners. Well, thanks, Neil, and thank you once again to the National Museum of the Royal Navy for hosting us this week. Next week.